Good afternoon, students. Today I am starting parasitology. Entamoeba histolytica is the parasite which I will be taking today. This parasite belongs to the group Protozoa and this amoeba is not a new word to you. You have been studying this particular amoeba from your school life. As you know, amoeba, it is a free living parasite which does not have an fed shape and It has got pseudopodia, which are its locomotory organs. The amoeba is made up of cytoplasm, which is being divided into ectoplasm and endoplasm. Pseudopodia are formed by the projections that are blunt type, the ectoplasm proceeds and followed by the endoplasm. The amoeba has vacuoles, food vacuoles, contractile vacuoles and other organs. The reproduction of Amoeba occurs usually by binary fission. So this was the introduction of amoeba or precisely ant amoeba histolite. Now this amoeba, as I told you, they are structurally simple protozoans without big shape. The phylum to which amoeba belongs is Sarcomastigophora. Subphylum is Sarcodina, Superclass, Rhizopora, Order Amoebida. Now, amoeba, it is a free living intestinal or intestinal type of parasite. Ant amoeba histolytica is a intestinal amoeba. All intestinal amoeba are non-pathogenic except Entamoeba histolytica. So it is not that all the amoebas that are present in the water or in the places where they are existing, all are not pathogenic. The species that is pathogenic to the humans is Entamoeba histolytica, which is going to specially attack the intestine of the humans. The amoeba are actually free living and all are not pathogenic as I told you earlier, but this free living amoeba are also opportunistic pathogens. Oh. Now, this ant amoeba histolytica was discovered in 
1875 by Lodge. He had demonstrated this parasite in the dysentery of a patient in Russia. This was how, for the first time, Entamoeba histolytica causes dysentery was known to the world. Now, Entamoeba histolytica, the points which we, will go, we are going to study is the morphology, life cycle, pathogenesis and clinical features, laboratory diagnosis, treatment and prevention. Morphology. Entamoeba histolytica occurs in three forms, proposite, precessed and cyst form. Now, trophozoic form is a vegetative form or it is the growing stage of the parasite. The stropocyte is the form that is also present in the tissues. Trophozoids are irregular in shape, the size being 12 to 60 micrometers. The average size is around 20 micrometers. The stropozoids, they are the pathogenic form and they are going to cause the infection to the human being. These trophozoids are very motile, that is, they are very actively motile in the fresh past stools and the size of the trophozoid and its motility usually decreases in the convulsant for convulsants and the carriers. Trophozoids are usually the common cells that are seen in the human intestine. But they are quite small in the human intestine. The size being around 15 to 20 micrometers. They are also called as minuta form of the parasite. As you can see this diagram, in this diagram you can see that the shape of the parasite is irregular, it has got the ectoplasm, endoplasm and this trophozoid or this parasite which is present in the intestine, it is going to ingest the erythrocyte. The trophozoid has the nucleus and the pseudopodia, which are blunt in shape. So, in figure A, you can see the natural occurrence of this endomeba histolytica, and in the B, you can see how the pseudopodium has been formed. Now coming to cytoplasm of this parasite, you will see 
it the cytoplasm is divided into outer ectoplasm and inner endoplasm the ectoplasm is transparent clear and refractive whereas the endoplasm is composed of a finely granular particles which gives ground glass appearance to it the endoplasm consists of nucleus food vacuoles erythrocytes sometimes you will find leukocytes and the tissue debris too because this organism is going to inject whatever it finds on its way therefore the leukocytes and the tissue debris are also seen in the endoplasm pseudopodia as i already told you that they are produced by the elongation of the ectoplasm subsequently the endoplasm has been pushed and finger like projections are formed by sudden jerky movements in the direction where the ectoplasm has been jerked and pushed which is followed by streaming of the whole of the endoplasm into the projection that was pushed and the motility or the movement of amoeboid is a typical one which is known as crawling or guiding the formation and the motility of the amoeba is depending upon the temperature of the body if the temperature of the body is more then the formation or motility of the protozoa increases whereas the low temperature will decrease the formation of pseudopodia and motility of the parasite in the figure we have seen that there is a presence of the nucleus and the nucleus of the parasite is not exactly located in the center but usually is centric in nature it is a spherical unit which is 4 to 6 micrometers in size it contains karyosome which is surrounded by a clear halo and anchor to the nucleus the nuclear membrane by fine radiating fibrils called the linen network giving a cart wheel appearance to the nucleus now the nucleus nuclear membrane is lined by the rim of chromatin which is distributed evenly as small granules and it the prophozoid form 
वतन एक सेकेंड नेक्स्ट Proposals from acute dysentric stools often contain the phagocytosed erythrocytes, the which is the diagnostic feature of even amebiasis. These are not found in any other common cell intestinal amoeba. These are divided by binary fission in every eight hours, and they are killed by drying, heat, and chemical sterilization. Infections are not transmitted by this destroy by these as destroyed in the stomach and cannot initiate. the infection now pre cystic stage in pre cystic stage this prophozoids they will undergo encystment in the lumen before encystment the prophozoids extrude the food vacuoles and becomes Round or oval in shape, which is around ten to twenty micrometers, and this is the pre-cystic stage. It contains a large glycogen vacuole and two chromatin bars, which then secretes an refractile cyst wall. around itself and the cystic refractile wall becomes the cyst later now see this is the amoeba this is the nucleus and this are the two chromatin bars this is the glycogen mass and you will see that this is a uninucleate stage which is turning to binucleate stage and you can see this two nuclei later on this nuclei goes on dividing by binary fission to form four nuclei the chromatids also start dividing and you will see that more of the chromatids and there are the four nuclei that is present and this is a mature quadrinuclear cyst and this cyst is the spherical in shape with 10 to 20 micrometers and the cyst exists in three stages that is early cyst binucleate cyst and mature quadrinucleate cyst as i told you earlier that in early cyst stage there is a nucleus and two chromatids chromatids in binucleate stage you will see that there are four chromatids and two nuclei and in mature quadrinuclear stage you will see that the there are four nuclei and eight chromatids that are present this early cyst stage with two structures and a mass of glycogen and one to four chromatids or four chromatid bars are seen and as and when 
the cell starts maturing, the glycogen mass and the chromatid bars start disappearing. The nuclei undergoes successive mitotic division, which converts, which helps in conversion from uninucleate state to binucleate state and to quadrinucleate state. The cyst wall that has been formed is highly resistant to the gastric juices and helps the parasite to survive in the unfavorable conditions. So we have seen the amoeba, how it looks, what are the stages of amoeba, how it, it protects itself, and how or which is the infective type. Now we'll study the life cycle of amoeba, how it is going to go into the human being, how it is going to cause amoebiasis, and how it is going to exit of the body. Now in life cycle, we'll take first the infective form or how a human is affected. In infective form, the mature quaternucleate cyst, which is passed in the feces, of the convulsions or the carriers, it goes and attacks the host or a new host. How can it occur? No one is going to go and just touch it or see it because I am very minute and you never come to know that they are present here or there because you cannot see them by your naked eye. As well as, you don't come to know it's their presence in the environment or the food party, food, what you're taking, the fruits, the vegetables, what are being consumed. So how it is going to enter your body and how it is going to start the infection. So the mode of transmission of this parasite in human being is by contaminated food and water. So when this Mature quadrinucleate cyst, it enters the human being through this contaminated food and water, it reaches the stomach. As we have seen earlier that the cyst wall is resistant to the gastric juice, so without being destroyed, or without excitation, the cyst is going to reach to the cecum or lower part of the ileum. In the ileum, when the cyst reaches there, it causes excitation. And this is because of the alkaline medium that is present in the ileum. The cyst wall gets damaged because of the trypsin that is present leading to the excitation of the parasite. Now see this prophosoid that is this pre-cyst it enters and the cyst with one of four nuclei that is this pre-cyst which is a binucleate state when it enters into the body 
if during that time it gets converted into the cystic stage in the cystic stage you will see that it gets converted into the quadrinucleate cyst and then it is passed in the feces this feces is going to contaminate the food and water and then this is they are able to survive this when a human being is going to take this contaminated food or water the cyst gets ingested by the human being once the cyst is going is ingested or swallowed by the human being it reaches the stomach and the stomach does not allow this cyst to dissolve because the refractory cyst which has been produced is not going to be dissolved by the acidity of the stomach so this metacyst form goes and reaches the small intestine and in small intestine by the trypsin the dissolution or it dissolves the cyst and the metacystic trophozoites are released this trophozoites which are released in the colon they are the infective forms and when excitation occurs you will see that it is going to change from quadrinucleate metastasis to eight daughter amoebae that are seen in the cecum that is what they are going to divide when they are going to go into the lumen from there once they are gone into the intestine small intestine then from metacystic stage they will get converted into the eight cells or eight nuclei stage and eight daughter amoebae are formed this is a trophozoite or this is the infective form how the infection occurs this infective trophozoite goes and gets attacked or invades the lumen and in the large intestine once they are going to go into it and stay or in the or they will penetrate into the cells that is how the infection occurs in human being and this once they are reaching the cells they start multiplying the pathogenesis and clinical features once the infection occurs in the human being uh, both intestinal as well as extra intestinal features in intestinal amebiasis the pathogenesis that are seen is this amoeba or the daughter nuclei they are dwelling in the lumen of the intestine and they cause the disease only when they in they invade the intestinal tissue once they are in the intestinal tissue they start multiplying remultiplying every 8 hours and the patient may not show any symptoms only 10% of the patient are going to give us symptoms whereas 90% of them are go symptomatic 
yet we should remember that not all the strains of entamoeba histolytica are pathogenic nor all are invasive only few strains of entamoeba histolytica they are pathogenic as well as invasive and therefore they can penetrate into the cells of the intestine they can invade there they can multiply there and that is how the infection named as amebiasis is produced now how can we make out the difference between pathogenic and non pathogenic strains of amoeba that is susceptibility to the complement mediated lysis phagocytic activity by the use of genetic markers monoclonal antibodies and zymodem analysis we can find out whether the entamoeba histolytica that infection is pathogenic or non pathogenic once this amoeba have infected or invaded the lumen they start multiplying there and once they are multiplied you will see that there is a raised area or a nodule in that area and this nodule or a area which is raised will have a small pounding edges and this uh, this particular raised area will start breaking down and discharging a brownish necrotic material which is going to contain large number of prosposoids and this amoeba which is eating away the lumen of the intestine produces ulcers this ulcers are typical in amoebiasis because on the when you are looking on the intestine you will not see any necrotic place or any degraded thing that is seen on the lining of the lumen but you will see that here and there some raised areas are present and inside this the cells of the trophozoites are multiplying and when they are multiplying they are ulcerating that means they are eating away all the cells in the lumen and that is how they are going to cause necrosis to the underlying tissue when the quantity increases then this necrotic material oozes out of that forming a small hole and all the things appear out outside in the lumen that is how you will see that 
the neck is small and the base is having a flask therefore you say that amoeba produces flask like ulcers so when many such ulcers are produced on the within the lumen of the intestine or within the tissue of the intestine this multiple ulcers may coalesce to form the necrotic lesions with racked and undetermined edges covered with brownish slough the infection usually does not go into the deeper layers that is mucosa submucosa serosa and all that adventure all the layers are there but this also are going to get acquainted or get limited to mucosa and submucosa layer okay did you understand so the infection is between the mucosal and submucosal layer where this flash shaped ulcers are formed and this is the characteristic of amebiasis the brownish necrotic material which is being discharged from this ulcers will contain large number of strophozoids which are going to attack the mucosa of the lumen and that's how the number of parasite increases or invades the intestine and then the symptoms start appear occasionally a granulomatous pseudo tumoral growth may develop on the intestinal wall and form chronic ulcer now when we say a granulomatous pseudo tumoral growth that means when this ulcers are formed flash shaped ulcers are formed the edges they are not specified the edges start growing more that is there is inflammation because of the infection there is inflammation this inflammation start developing the granulomatous tissue and this granulomatous tissue which has been repeatedly growing so the number of cells that are being grown in that particular area starts looking like a tumor so it is known as a granulomatous pseudo tumoral growth that appears on the edges of the ulcer so this growth develops into a uh, which develops on the wall of the intestine turns into the chronic ulcer this amoebic granuloma or amoeboma may be mistaken for malignant tumor because the growth is faster the edges are not specified that is they are irregular and therefore it can be mistaken for the malignant tumor lesions in chronic intestinal amebiasis so how the lesions are going to appear how you can see this amebiasis i mean the infection in the intestine small superficial ulcers involving only the mucosa are seen then round or oval shape with rack and undermined margins and a flash shape cross section when we see that you will see that there is a flash shape ulcers but from outside when you see the round or oval shape to look 
there is a scarring of the intestinal wall thinning dilatation and saturation of this intestinal wall is seen extensive adhesion with neighboring viscera is seen formation of tumor like masses of granulomatous tissues are seen and this is how the whole of it is going to appear clinical features of intestinal amebiasis the incubation period is highly variable it is not that the person has taken the infected food or infected water he is coming tomorrow to you saying that i'm having dysentery it will take time because as i told you that trypozoid which is an active motile form when it enters into the body it goes to the stomach and then to the intestine where is it gets attached to the walls of the intestine there it is changing it is changing from pre cystic form to cystic and quadrinucleate stage which is an infective form it is going to attach to the for mucosal wall enter into the submucosa cause the infection there it is going to change from quadrinucleate to the eight daughter cell stage that is when it is going to break from quadrinucleate stage it is going to divide and break by binary fission therefore eight proposoids will be eight daughter proposoids will be formed and they are active and they are going to invade the submucosa after invading the submucosa they start actively multiplying and then this nerve accumulation of this activity of multiplication and staying in the submucosa causes flash shape ulcers they are going to ingest the rbcs the uh, in uh, tissue there and all that and this necrotic fluid when the area has been completely invaded then this is going to burst out throwing the necrotic brownish color substance which is known as encovy sauce also okay so this encovy sauce is nothing but the brownish necrotic rbcs etc taken by the proposoids and when they are going to release out this fluid or all this material it looks sauce like therefore the name has been given encovy sauce so the period incubation period for this is around 1 to 4 months the clinical course is characterized by the prolonged latency relapse and intermission the prolonged latency means when this particular trophozoite goes into the intestine and does not produce any symptoms it is going to stay there it is going to multiply it is going to cause all the flash up ulcers and sometimes they will coalesce and form a larger ulcer and once they break then they will release all the content which has been excreted as in the form of dysentery they are going to pass out of the human being when we say relapse means if the person has been treated for amebiasis and after giving the treatment the person becomes 
or he gets cured and again gets infected that is known as relapse and this is quite possible if the hygiene is not maintained if the food that has been taken by the person has not been properly cooked it has not been properly washed before cooking hygienic uh, hygienic uh, conditions are not maintained like washing the hands before eating the food washing the hands after going to the toilet or passing the stools and so on here you will see that the infection can occur it is not only the self hygiene that has to be maintained the hygiene has to be maintained throughout the family throughout the place where you are taking the food and everywhere because any one can pass this infection for example you are going to a canteen you are going to a hotel and the person who is serving you is infected he has not taken proper measures he is going to infect his hands and the with the same hand he is going to give you water he is going to serve and that is how you will see that the protozoids are ingested by you and that's how you develop the infection secondly when you are taking food outside you are not sure that the person who is preparing this food has washed the vegetables fruits earlier with water properly he has done anything or not and that is how the infection infected food is going into has been consumed by you many times it happens that some infected person is along with you you don't know you have a colleague or a person who is infected and you are using or you are sharing his utensils you are sharing his beds undergarments towels all these places also the amoeba can exist and that is how the person can indirectly be infected when i say intermissions that means intermissions means you are cured for some time and again reinfected at a fixed interval that means you are not completely cured and this is usually seen in the persons who are taking food outside their houses in the canteens in the hotels on the road sides and all that these people are tending to develop amoebiasis frequently typical manifestations in amoebic dysentery compared to bacillary dysentery it is usually insidious in onset and the abdominal tenderness tenderness is less and localized so the feces or the dysentery or the stools that are passed by amoeba amoebic infected patient that is very large stools are seen they have very foul smelling they are stained black and brownish 
they are so often having blood and streak mucus intermingling with the feces and that is how you come to know that the person is having or suffering or infected with the dysentery comparing to the bacillary dysentery it is in usually the onset is insidious i said that is it takes time to develop it is not that today you have consumed and tomorrow you are going to face the disease because it has one to four months of incubation whereas in bacillary dysentery the insidious onset is seen because the multiplication is very fast and that is how the onset becomes insidious here in amoebic dysentery you will see that the abdomen has been bloated that is one of the very important sign that is seen in amoebases that abdomen is bloated gases have been accumulated because of this amoeba amoeba that has been invading or that has been causing the necrosis of the tissues even the sugars they have been fermented that's why foul smelling of the feces is there okay that is the reason now intestine and amoebases here you can see the ulcer on the colon that is there okay this is the ulcer that has been seen the stools of the patient of amoebases will contain large number of rbcs and reddish brown in color the cellular exudates scanty the dysentery or the stools may contain charcoal laden crystals which is one of the important sign of amoebases the patient who is usually a febrile and non toxic but if the infection is large if it is very the, the multiplication of the cells i mean uh, protozoans are more in large quantity large number then because of the toxins that are shedded in the lumen that is absorbed and therefore they can cause the febrile conditions it can cause the toxicity in full fulminant colitis there is confluent ulceration necrosis of the colon and this is what i said that the patient is febrile and toxic that is the stage that is when the whole of the lumen whole of the mucus of the lumen has been infected more of the cells have been multiplied in the submucosal region and that is how the patient is been developing a fulminative colitis fulminant colitis colitis that is inflammation of the colon which is there intestinal amoebases is not always a result in dysentery but quite often there may be only diarrhea with vague abdominal symptoms that is uncomfortable belly and growing growling abdomen because much of the gases are accumulated chronic involvement of the cecum causes a condition stimulating appendicitis
so the complications coming to the end of this that is complications and sequelae fulminant amebiasis or colloidal colitis it causes toxic megacolon perianal ulceration and amoeboma extra intestinal amebiasis is also common you will see amoebic hepatitis amoebic liver abscess amoebic appendicitis amoebic peritonitis pulmonary amoebiasis cerebral amoebiasis splenic abscess cutaneous amoebiasis urogenitary amoebiasis now you can see the schematic diagram how amoebiasis can cause the infections or affections when the amoeba invades the diaphragm it can go to the lungs it can cause suffrenic abscess in the liver it can go into the portal circulation cause primary infection in the colon perianal skin gets involved and reaches the genitals in primary infection in the colon it can cause reach the peritoneum and cause the peritonitis when it reaches the general circulation cause as the or invades the spleen suprarenal region and the kidney in the liver when it is causing amoebic liver it can cause or it can reach the pericardium peritoneum stomach intestine inferior vena cava and so on so this is how the extra amoebic affections can be seen now this is the liver abscess this is how the liver has been affected so extra intestinal amoebas as i saw said hepatic amoebas pulmonary amoebas metastatic amoebas cutaneous amoebas genito urinary amoebas so this is what this is how i conclude today's lecture if any questions any queries kindly write to me or call me and clear your doubts so good day everyone